up was Blue Boy with Grave Fission. Hey there, friends. I'm Nuclear Yuki, and welcome to another episode of A Nuclear Reading Show. Today, we're continuing on with KCAT's Fallout Equestria. If you're enjoying what I'm bringing to the cold, dark wasteland, don't be afraid to tell your friends about me, or find me on Twitter as Nuclear Yuki. It's a big help. And another thing, since the gangs can be a bit feisty, Fallout is owned by Bethesda, and Hasbro made my little pony, Friendship is Magic. With all that said and done, welcome, friends, to the wasteland. Chapter 43, Kingdom of the Blind, Part 2. DJ Pwn 3, Homage was okay. Or, at least, she was okay when this was recorded. Knowing her, this broadcast was rigged to occur hours after she had left. As Watcher had said, she wasn't making it easy for the Enclave. I interrupt the Enclave's depressing-ass music for a very special broadcast. Today, I have with me two members of the Wasteland Resistance. None other than the Enclave-fighting duo of Lion and Mouse. And I'll be speaking with them about the good fight the blows they've struck to the Enclave, and what every pony can do to lend a hoof. But first, the weather! I drank in her voice. Disguised as it was, it was still her. I could hear my homage, feel her presence behind every single word. My heart stirred, taking strength, yet splitting with sorrow. Never again. I'd never see, feel, smell my homage again. Oh, goddesses. I pled under my breath, my body beginning to shake. Please don't let that be true. I'd do anything, give anything. Please, just give me this one thing. DJ Pwn 3's voice, a miracle in the fire and the darkness, continued to break through. Completely cloudy, with a chance of big black thunderclouds over the Everfree Forest and the valley between Manhattan and Philadelphia. I predict one of those two cities is in for some really nasty weather very, very soon. So if you're in the... The signal went dead. No DJ Pwn 3. No music. Nothing. The Enclave had shut down the broadcast completely. My heart stopped. I stood frozen, paralysed. Until the cathedral shook under a mighty, rending rumble. The crippled raptor had finally lost any semblance of control and was crashing into one of the battlements outside, gouging out an avalanche of sundered stone. The raptor's storm clouds dissipating in a hurricane blast that shattered the nearby windows into razor shards and pink fine dust. I instinctively lashed out with my telekinesis, pushing back at the debris, keeping it away from us and from the children, terrified at the consequences of breathing powdered pink cloud glass. The children screamed and no longer needed coaxing to get down the stairs. We swiftly followed. The first sublevel beneath the chapel was dedicated to bypass spells and weaponry. The archway we had just passed beneath read, Productivity is the right of every pony. Here, Red Eye's disciples had enchanted almost a thousand firearms for his army. Like the barracks, these rooms were now empty save for the occasional guard or passerby, none of whom gave Reggie more than a second look. Just because a pony is born with wings or a horn does not make them inferior. Red Eye's voice played in my ear bloom, part of an audio log stamped with the logo of Stable 101. I'd spotted it amongst a stack of books on a shelf just inside the archway. The audio log was apparently part of a recorded discussion between Red Eye and the overmayor of Stable 101, a remnant of his past that someone from the stable had deemed to save. The debate was taking place over dinner at what sounded like a crowded table. The munching of food and the clinking of plates and glasses created a constant background din and occasionally the voices of others at the table murmured into my ear, making it hard to pick out what Red Eye or the Overmare was saying. The first Griffin Chaser was designed and built by an Earth Pony in a matter of minutes. The Overmare countered silkily. The entire town of Appaloosa was created by Earth Ponies in less than a year. Do you honestly think Unicorns or Pegasi could have just taken us from muskets to machine guns in just a few decades? As we walked, I looked around, trying to shake loose memories of where to go next. Unfortunately... Few, if any, alicorns had been on this level during their assault on my mind. 
Unicorns and Pegasi have their own special talents which they bring to the table. This younger-sounding red eye countered. For example, without unicorns, we wouldn't have healing potions. Without the Pegasi, Equestria would have been ravaged by wild weather. Each race of pony kind adds to the whole. No one greater or more important than the others. It is a vital gestalt, requiring all three. It is wrong for Earth ponies to set themselves up above the others. Above us, the cathedral was rocked by a succession of heavy explosions. The stone ceiling tiles cracked, and dust raining down. Reggie looked up, guessing, One of the bombing wagons. Much more of that, and they might punch through. Magic. The overmare chuckled. Let me tell you a little about pony magic. As it so happens, there was a particularly magical earth pony in my ancestry. His name was Joe. He worked in Cantalot as a craftsman making coffee cups. Though he was no unicorn and knew no spells, the coffee cups he crafted would always be clean. They would never stain, and it took tremendous force to crack them or make them chip. Why? Because making these cups was a labour of love, and that natural earth pony magic infused each of his creations. We reached a locked door. No cloud controls this time. Just a good, old-fashioned tumbler lock. Seeing it made me absurdly happy. I telekinetically picked it before I realised I intended to. I opened the door, hoping for a stairwell down, and instead found a storeroom, full of assault carbines, shotguns, ammo and more. Calamity looked like he had just died and gone to heaven. I sighed. Take what we can grab quickly. Calamity became a flying rust and orange blur. And that won't slow us. Calamity stopped in front of me. Every single damned weapon slug about his body and an assault carbine in his mouth. I heard an impressed, wow, from Reggie. One, one, he asked innocently. I went ahead and took the slightly drooled on assault carbine and several magazines of ammo. It would be good to have a backup for little Macintosh. First, the magic of Pegasus and unicorns are flashy shortcuts to hard work. And without hard work, where is the drive for innovation? When has a Pegasus or a unicorn ever needed to be creative? Second, the magic of Pegasus and unicorns are selfish. The shortcuts they provide, the labour they save, is only for themselves. Whereas the innovations of Earth ponies can be shared by all ponies and be built upon by future Earth ponies. Finally, the magic of Pegasus and unicorn ponies is demanding, I'd say even crippling. Where Earth ponies can throw themselves directly into their work, the Pegasus of the past needed flight camps, and the unicorns needed magical schooling just to be able to use the magic they'd been born with. Time that could be spent learning other skills was spent instead mastering their magic. Not so with the Earth ponies. Our magic is inherent, and innately applied to the work we do. While the unicorn's magic is spell casting, the Pegasus's magic is impossible flight and prancing on clouds, our magic is to be superior at what we do. Earth ponies are inherently superior because that is our gift. Hi, Reggie called out, standing at another door. I think I found the way down. Shortcuts, Red Eye offered smoothly, are sometimes useful, critical even. Sure, the Earth Pony way builds things that lasts, but it is a slow process, and sometimes you need a quick fix. Take, for example, poison. An Earth Pony may be able to test your blood, identify the poison, and brew an antidote. But all of that can take hours which you do not have. Isn't it better to have a unicorn on hoof who can cast a spell purging any poison away? Red Eye! The Overmare sighed drolly. I am not impressed with this newfound insight you claim from your scouting missions. I speak in sweeping truths and you argue isolated examples. Exceptions that are not sufficient to disprove the rule. Now I... The Overmare fell silent. There was a pregnant pause before the voice of the young Red Eye asked casually, Overmare, you were saying? Then, even more casually, he added, Is something wrong? I... why haven't... Yes? He prompted, I'm afraid I don't follow. The sounds of the dinner table died away. I imagined every pony was staring at Red Eye in the Overmare. I suspected the latter had suddenly gone alarmingly pale. Very softly, the Overmare murmured, I just noticed you haven't so much as tasted your drink. The Cathedral, Sublevel 3, Cyber Surgery. 
A plaque on the wall read, Until all of us can be free, none of us should be free. The hall we had merged into announced, Research and surgery in one direction, Administration in the other. Both paths seeming otherwise equal, I had chosen the former, suspecting there was a fair chance of running across Red Eye himself at administration, and that wasn't my goal. I was here for his prisoners, his sacrifices, not him. I was more than happy to leave him to the Enclave. I was regretting that decision now. The smell of blood, spoiled meat and disinfectants hit my nostrils like a buck to the face, making me turn and gag. Reggie recoiled, and I could hear the muffled sound of Calamity's many, many guns clattering together as he staggered. The walls of the surgical labs were a gleaming, disinfected white that made every floor and discoloration and old stain stand out. The floor tiles were cold and felt unpleasantly damp. There were highly advanced machines built into the walls and ceiling, half of which I couldn't even guess the purpose of. There were vats of strange liquid, and floating within them were a variety of cybernetics. My eyes took in a mechanical snake that resembled a pony's spine, a robotic leg that clearly wasn't for a pony, metal arms that could have been torn from a cleaning robot, and more esoteric devices, strings of wire ending in arcanotech baubles. There were three exits. One was the way we came in, the hallway leading back to the administration section of the sublevel. The opposite led to the stairs down. The final door, directly across from me, was open to what the sign claimed was a storage room, Huge glass tubes displayed creatures and monsters, subjects of cybernetic experimentation. All were dead, many still splayed open from surgery, everything from radroaches to manticores. There was even a hellhound, or at least half, the left half. At the back end of the room was a cast iron hatch marked Disposal. Most of the stench was coming from that storage room only a little from the meat on several of the tables surrounding me. And how may I help you? The thing in front of us asked. It, he, had been a pony once, but now he was more machine than flesh. The whole lower half of his body replaced by a robotic chassis that reminded me of the brain bots in Iron Shot Firearms. Mechanical arms, like those from the hovering spider bots, each ending in a different tool or manipulator, flexed and moved about him carrying out unspoken tasks of medicine and science. It only saw Regina, but my heart began beating like a frightened rabbit every time it looked my way. Reggie flinched away as one of those arms moved towards her, probing. Nothing. I'm fine. Fine. Yes, I suppose, the creature said. But you could be better. I felt myself cringe. Better? Regina questioned skeptically. Like you. Indeed, you should have seen me before the grenade, the creature chuckled. I know the looks are a bit to get used to, but old Doc Slaughter has never been better. Several of the arms paused on their tasks to wave. And you can't imagine just how useful these are. Maybe you could, being a griffin. His chassis turned, extending one arm in particular, one that ended in mechanical talons. Reggie took an involuntary step back looking repulsed. Dr. Slaughter. I knew that name. Oh, and tag her to go see Doc Slaughter. She's got one of those leg terminals that are a bitch to get off. He was in Philadelphia. I narrowly avoided losing my pit buck to him. You created that cyber dragon, didn't you? Reggie surprised me by asking. Oh, yes. Possibly my best work. Doc Slaughter said proudly, his chassis spinning back to the arms scurried about their tasks. A most unique opportunity. Poor thing's body was falling right out from under it. He was blind when Red Eye brought me to him, and he could barely fly. Failing ticker. Red Eye offered the dragon new eyes and more for half his gems. He purred wistfully. And just look at him now. Stronger, faster, more powerful and lethal than he was in his prime. If he wanted his new life so badly, why is he out there risking it? My dear, you say that as if he might be harbouring a death wish or something, Doc Slaughter said, the tracks on his chassis spinning, delivering him from one side of the lab to another. But that's not the case at all. He simply has no other choice. No other choice? Red Eye enslaved the dragon. 
We heard explosions and the sounds of rapid-fire magical energy weapons. They sounded like they were coming from the floor above us. Red Eye wasn't going to have a creature that powerful and dangerous in the Everfree Forest without having it on a leash, you know. The Cyberdoc explained, ignoring the battle that was quickly catching up to us. So when we replaced the Dragon's Heart with a newer and better one, Red Eye had me install a Matrix Disruption Grenade in there with it. Red Eye sends a signal, the dragon turns off. The Gryphon Arm clanked its talons together, just like that. That's horrible. Reggie gasped. And really, really stupid. Now he has a super powerful dragon who hates him. Hates him? Nox Slaughter laughed. Not at all. The dragon loves his new body. And Red Eye isn't foolish enough to abuse the situation. The dragon's cage is very gilded. Another explosion caused the lights to flicker and a few tiles to drop on the ceiling. This time, the Cyberdoc reacted. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to seal up this lab. I'm expecting a new patient, and we can't be disturbed. Suddenly, dangerously familiar classical music began to pour through the intercoms. It was followed a moment later by Red Eye's voice. The voice of the older, wasteland-hearted stallion I knew too well. Now that our esteemed guests have arrived, I thought I'd help make you feel at home. This is one of your favourites, right, Sortum Leaf? His tone was pleasant as if the whole battle and all the pain and blood that came with it was nothing more than a rapping at the door. I admire your taste, Autumn. May I call you Autumn? And I do agree that Octavia never played a more splendid and perfect recorded performance. Yes, I know her works well. I grew up with them. In a softer, wry voice, he couldn't prevent himself from adding, She was an earth pony after all. As we scurried to leave, the Cyberdoc added, He even let him keep all his gems. The Cathedral, sub-level 4. We were almost there. Almost where I was sure we needed to be. The markings on the doors labelled this level as Metapony Testing. The inscription over the main door read, We ascend together, or we fail together. The walls were a mottled brown stone that seemed to be secreting a thick layer of slime. Reggie grimaced in disgust. This place just gets worse and worse. What do you think that means, Metapony Tester? Calamity asked, his voice suggesting he knew the answer and really hoped he was wrong. I think it means exactly what you think it means, I answered gloomily. There was only one way to go this time, and that was through a sealed vault door up ahead. An access terminal was mounted on a wall nearby. Once again, no clouds. Just regular, hackable goodness. The way you talked, I didn't think your stealth missions tended to go this smoothly. Regina commented, pulling out her guns and checking the loads. I ain't complaining. Just, I'm afraid if I don't get to shoot something soon, I'm gonna forget how. Unity. The password was Unity. I felt cheated. He wasn't even trying. Entering the password gave me access to the terminal's contents. The first option was to unlock the vault door and open it, but beneath that, I was surprised to see a number of scientific journal entries. Curiosity pushed me to glance at the first. The contents drove me to read the others. Entry 5. What a fucking waste of my valuable time. Now I have to scrap the whole mother cunt fucking IMP experiments. Red fucking eye wants to take the research in a new direction. One failure too many. If you can make a fucking omelette without a few generations of dead chickens. I told his imminent godness that the guidance factor may be more than just genetic. But what the fuck do I know? I'm just a motherfucking scientist. He's a glorified fucking scout. How can I argue against that? Now he's got me looking at some him damn piece of shit rock. Like I don't have better things to do. Do I look like a fucking geologist? Entry 4. The culmination of two years of experiments, and I can write what we learned on a fucking napkin. You know what that tastes like? Tastes like a cunt that's been shit on. There are five stages of impelled metamorphosis development in a viable subject. The first three levels are well documented in my research journals. The most significant being incremental changes to the subject's relationship to tolerance of radiation. Radiation induced regeneration, even to the point of regrowing limbs, begins at the first stage and radically improves in the second. 
When the subject reaches the third stage of impaled metamorphosis development, the subject's body actually becomes stronger and faster in the presence of radiation, similar to the glowing ghoul, and a precursor to the super alicorn phenomenon. The subject's healing becomes so advanced that the natural aging process is all but halted. The fourth stage involves underlying physiological changes in the preparation for the fifth and final stage, complete metamorphosis. For example, the pony's body and mind begin to grow the necessary neurological structures that will allow the pony to utilize the new horn and or wings that the final stage will bestow, as well as other substructure changes in support of the less obvious but more radical alterations that accompany becoming a fucking alicorn. It is in this stage that everything goes to fuck all on a speeding enema. The impelled metamorphosis potion was never intended to be administered in stages. The most pleasant of the side effects to stage 4 can be described as phantom limb syndrome. The false sensations experienced by subjects appear to be constant and amazingly painful. Subjects in stage 4 are inevitably driven to seek out more exposure or simply driven utterly blood-winged shit insane. All too often, both. The real problems come with the extremely narrow bridge between the third stage and the fourth, and with what I have deemed the guidance factor. First, it is proven virtually impossible to expose a pony to enough IMP to bring them to the third stage without crossing the threshold into the fourth. The few examples of successfully stable third stage subjects have all been in the wild under unrepeatable circumstances, which is too fucking bad, since stable threes have capabilities that gives Doc Slaughter's vaunted enhancements a rung for their bits. Second, I've determined that successful metamorphosis requires more than just sufficient exposure. It requires a sort of guidance through the process. In the case of the existing alicorns, this guidance is given by the goddess. Whether this is a product of some intentional nurturing or environmental response is unclear. Well, it's unclear to fucking me. Red Eye has this template theory and has pretty much stopped listening to any fucking thing else. As a side note, I hate that freak of nature bastard upstairs. You know, maybe when a grenade blows your legs off and tears up the whole underside of your torso, that's a sign for you to just fucking die. Entry three. Fuck! I lost another assistant. That's a lab accident this time. No, that little cancerous prick decided to bail on me and pursue his own demented research some fucking where else. Him and his fucking manticore fixation. What a tail full of shit. He was a useful assistant particularly since he didn't have to sleep. Now I'll have to autopsy subjects 128 and 129 myself, and I'll have to refill the fucking lanterns on my own. Yet another waste of my time. I'll be missing the fucking bastard by tomorrow. What misses Stink, though. Speaking of Stink, they're finally putting in the new disposal chute. Slaughter's getting his part put in tomorrow. It's going to take them a fucking week to get around to putting in mine. I swear that fucker Red Eye gives preferential treatment to cybernetics. And then he comes down here clamouring for results. Says he's getting sick of sending me ponies only to have them tossed out with the waste. Like Red Eye should fucking talk. At least my research is doing something fucking useful. Asswipe. Entry 2. Finally perfected the induced metamorphosis potion recipe. Would have done it sooner if that psycho Twilight Sparkle hadn't been so fucking OCD with her notes. Now we've got that manticore shit out of the way. The bucks downstairs can start whipping up whole vats of the juice. Still not sure why the fuck his self-importance red-eye wants that much of it. He planned to go swimming? Be funny as hell if he did, actually. I'd love to see the fucker's whole body become a bloated, misshapen blob of metastasized living cancer. That'd be fucking hilarious! So far, the initial numbers have held. We have a solid 18% benevolent effect manifestation in test subjects. Not ideal, but I'd say it's a fuck ton better than we could have expected. And more than enough excuse to increase the scale of our tests. My assistant has expressed particular interest in one of our failed cross-species tests. Of course, I fully expected all cross-species tests to fail. The IMP was crafted specifically for ponies, after all, but the effect on other creatures could continue to yield enlightening results. The test that my assistant is most interested in, however, is one that has produced the least results. In fact, it produced no results at all. All the other creatures had at least some reaction, most of them violent and fatal. But I might as well have been shooting a concentrated fucking placebo into that manticore. Unless looking pissed off was an effect, IMP failed to have any effect on it what's-a-fucking-ever. On that note, I've ordered a more convenient waste disposal system. We've got passages under this place that dump into a gorge. Why don't we use them to flush out more of the stink? Entry 1. New project today. 
About fucking time. Last one was a pointless disaster. Why does the world want to keep fucking wasting my valuable fucking time? Got a good feeling about this one. That pompous prick red eye got a hold of some pre-war fancy mare's recipe for that crap the taint is made out of. The shit the goddess uses to fucking create alicorns. So far, four out of five test subjects have responded with the most grotesque, body-warping deaths. But the last one in five, very promising indeed. The entries were stamped from the personal files of Dr. Glue, head of Metapony Research. I stepped back from the terminal, feeling cold and hard. Subject 129, I whispered hoarsely. This pony had murdered over a hundred ponies in his experiments for Red Eye, probably double that, and other creatures too, tortured them to death with taint. I felt a ruddy darkness seep across my vision, a drive to violence mounting in every beat of my heart, the likes of which I hadn't felt since Arbu. My nerves were on fire. I kicked on my eyes forward sparkle, barely taking note of the new signal it had discovered, or the fact that it apparently announced I had found Stable 101, and ordered the terminal to open the door. I was really hoping Dr. Glue was behind it, because I was going to kill him. A lot. The door opened into a chamber of horrors, a catacomb for the horrifically malformed and mutated byproduct of Dr. Glue's experiments, lit sporadically by mounted lanterns, many of which were dark and cold. Ponies with massive tumours enveloping their heads, ponies whose internal organs had been pushed out and through their coats by the cancerous masses evolving inside them, ponies who had dissolved into bubbling, leathery slugs that looked like a hospital horror's miscarriage, discernible only as ponies by the warped remains of their cutie marks. Worse. The strains of classical music were being piped down here as well, a twisted counterpoint to the vileness. The music was defiled by being played in here. I didn't think I'd be able to enjoy Octavia's artistry again. Regina Grimfeathers was vomiting in a corner. I wanted to clamp my eyes shut against the horror, but I was afraid I would still see them. So I covered my face with my pit leg instead, staring at the screen. My eyes forward sparkle was picking up a flood of red lights ahead. Oh my soul, Calamity whimpered. He tossed back his hood and was staring in dismay at a body whose bones had undergone a rapid and twisting growth bursting through muscles and flesh that had turned black and slimy. I think this used to be a griffin. Regina's head shot up. She approached the body, spitting the last of the vomit from her mouth, her breast heaving heavily. What? How? And with mounting rage that echoed my own. Why? She swung around to calamity. How could any pony do this? What's the point? I couldn't say. Calamity began, taken aback. Then his voice grew sharp. But as my gal Velvet would say, any pony who would do that ain't a pony. Voices echoed from within the catacombs ahead. One of them was recognisable. Fan out, Colonel Autumn Leaf ordered. The coward ran this way. And if you find him, do not kill him. Just wound him excessively. But that bastard is mine. Eyes wide with recognition, Calamity vanished under the hood of his zebra cloak. I scooted against the wall, and Reggie moved amongst the bodies, playing dead, as two enclave soldiers galloped around a corner and charged past us. Reggie stepped out behind them as they passed, levelling her guns, but then lowered them, letting the two soldiers disappear. Stealth mission, she groused. I bet bits to bottle caps I'm going to regret that later. Get the fuck out! Get your hemorrhoidal fucking asses out of my laboratory! Dr. Glue bellowed at the four ponies surrounding him, three of whom appeared to be Enclave Elite guards. We could see them through the security glass window set into the lab door. Glue was a wizened old stallion with a pale grey coat and a stringy charcoal mane. His cutie mark was a blasphemy. Beside me, Regina was furiously trying to pick the lock with her talons. I could have opened it easily myself, but the moment I did so, she'd go charging into that room twin guns blazing, and we wouldn't win that fight without casualties. Behind me were the catacombs. To my left was a stone archway, and stairs leading down to a vault door flanked by mounted terminals. I couldn't picture the room beyond, but the fragmented alicorn memories told me that Red Eye's prisoners were down there. Angrily, the little pony in my head pointed out that we were almost there, and we were getting distracted. But not without good reason. No, no. I think we will keep you company while my mares hunt down your master. 
The reply came from a pony in magnificent jade carapace armour, exquisitely crafted and embellished with ebony filigree and a scarab motif of leaves and iridescent bronze and copper. I didn't need to see any part of the pony to know who it was. The voice was unmistakable. Colonel Autumn Leaf sneered casually as he strolled around the glue's lab of horrors. Just in case he doubles back. I was watching two mass murderers. The scope and heinousness of the evil in that room was breath-stealing. Truth be told, I wanted to charge in there guns blazing too. Or worse, there was enough blood in that room to fashion a guillotine for each of them. My little pony was horrified that such a plan crossed my mind, more so by just how appealing it was. What? Dr. Glow exploded, yanking my focus back to the window. What the fuck did you just say? You heard me. Red Eye is not my master! He exploded again, shaking with rage. And he's not coming back! He added, So you can take your fucking goon squad, shove them up your sphincter, and prance the fuck out of my lab. I've got important fucking research to do, and you're wasting my time! So you say, Autumn Leaf dismissed. He moved past chemistry sets, skirting a wall of cages filled with dead animals, and stopped at a machine I could not identify. Regina growled and took a swipe at the door. Fuck this, she muttered, drawing one of Cage's hellhound claw blades. Why not pick in the lock when I could just cut right down through it? I felt the calamity press up against me, the pony find hellhound's energy rifle held in his muzzle. I floated out little Macintosh and then paused. Wait, I have an idea. Regina stopped, her expression still seething, but her voice calm and smooth as polished steel. Okay, little pip, your way. Get away from that! Dr. Glue barked inside the room. That's a very delicate analyzer! Autumn Leaf pulled the front panel open just a little too hard, and I heard something snap. Dr. Glue roared and threw himself at the colonel, only to be forcibly blocked and pushed to the floor by the guards. Oops. I floated out the assault carbine and slid in one of the magazines, then pulled off the zebra stealth cloak, passing it to Regina. Both of you get back to at least two corridors. Oh crap, little Pip, what are you thinking? I'm thinking that if these bullets are enchanted with a bypass, then they'll go right through the door and right through their armour, I told my friend. One spray and they all go down. And if they ain't... You're giving away our position and bringing the wrath of the heaven down on your mane. Yeah, that was the problem. Regina's expression showed she had the same concern. I'll draw them away while you two remain hidden. I told him. I still have the advanced stealth buck. I'll trigger it once I've led them far enough away and then circle back to you. I looked back into the window, comparing their positions to the red lights on my EFS compass. I would get a few five-round bursts with this weapon while using sats, and I wanted to make sure I took down the armoured ponies first. My breath caught as Autumn Leaf produced a hunk of twisted, bluish metal. This. This is your critical research. Was that... The colonel's next words confirmed my darkest fears. You are researching star metal for Red Eye. It wasn't phrased as a question. I didn't know which filled me with more dread. What Red Eye's interest in star metal was. What Dr. Glow's experiments might entail or the fact that Autumn Leaf knew about star metal and could recognise it on sight. Don't touch that! Dr. Glue demanded, struggling against the guards. Get the hell away from my fucking experiments! Autumn Leaf tossed a chunk of Luna's old armour between his hooves. What are you doing with this? Shaving off slivers and feeding it to ponies to see what'll happen? Autumn Leaf no longer sounded bored or pleasant. Or perhaps you're making cybernetics with this metal. Is that what Red Eye has inside him? Regina moved up beside me. The cloak draped over her shoulders, but the hood down so she could look me in the eyes. No, little Pip, she whispered, holding out her talons for the assault carbine. Let me do this, for Cage. Inside the room, Dr. Glue was spitting. Are you fucking retarded? Is this how the infuck promotes, based on the number of your brain cells that have been replaced by diarrhea? Who the fuck is going to put bizarre-ass metal with unknown properties from motherfucking space in their fucking bodies? I still can't believe anybody was willing to make armour out of it. Taking a breath, he seethed. And cyber surgery is one floor up, you fetid asshole. Seriously, how long has it been since you were euthanized? 
I looked to Regina. She looked so much like her brother. I could see him in her, and that brought visions of him crumpling, dead from the weapon of an enclave soldier, killed on a mission that I led. What she was asking was for me to put her in equally grave danger. Yet, did I have the right to say no? The weight of the assault carbine suddenly felt much heavier, even though it was floating weightless. We can play rock, paper, scissors for it, Reggie suggested confusingly. I looked at her like she'd just spoken in zebra. Griffin game, she explained with a sigh. Rock beats scissors, scissors beats paper, paper beats rock. I'd win, ponies can only do rock. I still had no idea what the hell she was talking about. Oh, hell, Calamity said, tossing back his hood. I saw he'd put together Spitfire's thunder. It was laying on the ground at his hooves. This ain't gonna happen this way. Pushing past us, Calamity marched up to the door and pounded a hoof on the window. Hi, Brony! I wanna talk to you! He shouted. You got some things to answer for! Swinging around to me, he suggested, Run! All hell broke loose. Calamity? Colonel ultimately turned towards the window, startled recognition ringing clear in his voice. His recovery was swift, immediately followed by an order to his guards. Bring me that traitor, dead or alive. The elite guards jumped up to follow orders, spinning towards the door and unleashing a massive volley of magical light. The door heated up brightly, flooding the hall with plasmic light. It was like standing inside the goddess's celestial mane, and promptly began to melt. The stomach around it started hissing and glowing. The air near the door began blisteringly hot, and the powerful odour of molten slag and magic overrode the stench of blood, rot and spoiled meat from the catacombs. Regina snatched the assault rifle out of my levitation field, swinging it towards the melting door and returning fire. The sounds of gunfire and battle battles filled the room, drowning out the classical cello music. One of the red lights in my EFS compass winked out. I floated out Little Macintosh, using my compass to aim and waiting for enough of the door to slough away for me to take a shot. The light from the door was almost blinding. Calamity didn't have to wait. He flew back from the door, kicking Spitfire's thunder off the ground with a forehoof and catching it in his muzzle. The crack of the shot split the air. Another red light on my compass went out. The door collapsed, lancing beams of lethal magic filling the corridor. I fired a single shot as I scrambled for cover in the stairwell. Calamity and Regina dove behind the nearest deceased monstrosities crafted by Dr. Glue's research. Reggie let out a screech as one of the beams struck her right arm, burning away an inch of flesh, leaving a blackened and charred wound. The griffin dropped the assault rifle and collapsed behind a mound of misshapen flesh and barely recognisable limbs, tears streaming from her eyes as she dug healing potions out of her supplies. This was magical damage. I realised as I watched her hold a healing potion in her beak, popping her head back and gulping the magical liquid as her left talons drew out one of her pistols. At best, this would be a bad scar. More likely, she wouldn't ever be able to use her trademark two-pistol style effectively again. If we will live through all of this, ever again might be really short. I spun back towards the entrance. Two of the three elite guards had dropped. Calamity shifted Spitfire's thunder, pointing it directly at his older brother. Dr. Glue, no longer being held, jumped up and galloped past Calamity's brother, snatching the star metal shard in his teeth as he fled. The colonel stood his ground, staring through the door at Calamity. A hatch on the back of his jade, magically-powered armor popped open, and a small turret emerged, taking aim at Dr. Glue. The weapon built into the turret was bizarre, yet familiar, made of gleaming blue metal and a glowing power core. Colonel Autumn Leaf's star blaster fired at Dr. Glue, Unlike Amarja's weapon, the beam of energy was a cruel orange, and Dr. Glue was incinerated in a puff of fire. The colonel hadn't even needed to aim. Zenith was right. The weapons wanted to kill. Regina leaned around a pile of bloated bodies she was using for cover, trading shots with the remaining guard. A pulse of blue magic struck her in the back, staggering her but failing to penetrate her talon armour, as the two enclave soldiers came charging up from behind us. I spun around, slipping into sacks. One of them went down, the other swiveled to face me. The rainbow barrage from her multi-gem cannon forced me to change cover, one of the shots passing close enough to blister the flesh on the back of my neck. I could smell the scorched hairs of my mane. I returned fire, forcing her to duck back around the corner where she had come from. As I reloaded, 
the classical music was cut, replaced by the last voice we expected to hear. Calamity! Velvet Remedy asked, sounding distressed. My Pegasus friend gasped, dropping Spitfire's thunder to the floor in shock and worry. Autumn Leaf turned the alien fire blaster on his own brother. Velvet? Calamity asked, momentarily oblivious to anything else. What are you doing here? Only Reggie and the other guards seemed unhindered by the voices on the intercom. The guns Calamity had crafted for her were proving capable of punching through Enclave armor. The Enclave guard was already bleeding from several wounds. He kicked over a chemistry table and took cover behind it, trading shots with the Griffin. I invited her, said the cool, casual voice of Red Eye. Autumn Leaf spun towards the sound of Red Eye's voice and fired, <laughs> blasting one of the intercoms. Don't worry, Calamity. She's in good... His voice paused, as if unsure which word to use. Things with Dr. Slaughter. I'm expecting a new patient, and we can't be disturbed. Red Eye brought my friend right into harm's way. As what? A distraction? Leverage? What's that cyber psycho doing to Velvet? My little pony cried out as I ducked out of cover long enough to keep the Enclave soldier pinned. And what happened to Zenith? What about Pyolite? She was guarding them. What did Red Eye do? Now, now, Colonel. You can't kill me that way. Where are you? Autumn Leaf roared. In response, I heard a door slide open somewhere out of sight in the room beyond. Come and see. Red Eye offered. Calamity scooped up Spitfire's thunder, whipping around and firing a single shot through the helmet of the Enclave soldier as she shifted to fire again. The carapace-armoured Pegasus dropped with a dull thud. Y'all go ahead, he shouted to me. I'm going after Velvet. Autumn Leaf paused for just a moment, then chose his mission over murdering his brother. He reared and flew away from us. He's getting away, Reggie shouted, firing shots at the retreating Pegasus. Sparks flew where her bullets ricocheted off his jade armour. Go in, Calamity! I yelled back to her as I turned and galloped to the vault door at the bottom of the stairwell. Metal catwalks over glowing vats of IMP. The room at the nadir of Red Eyes Cathedral was nearly a perfect replica of the goddess's chamber in Maraponi. There was even a catwalk stretching out between the vats, ending in a pedestal with a cup. The room shimmered with a rippling light emanating from the glowing liquid filling each of the open-topped vats. This was Red Eye's ascension chamber. The door at the bottom of the stairwell had opened to a pony-sized platform, like a diving board, providing me with this dizzying view of the room below. After all the tight corridors, the abrupt spaciousness of this room had managed to kick up a lingering wisp of dread. Oh, agoraphobia, my old friend. I was suffering from vertigo, mixed with a severe deja vu. If this place hadn't been recently constructed, if the metal wasn't shiny and new, and the floor lacking the detritus-clogged lake I remembered so well, I might have started worrying there could be a balefire bomb beneath us. The giant cage dangling over one of the vats like a piñata filled with unicorns. That was different too. It had taken me two minutes to hack the terminal, and that was a minute and a half more than I would have actually needed if I hadn't been in denial. Really, can it ever be a good thing when your name is the password on someone else's terminal? There had been one last journal entry, entry 6, from Dr. Glue on the terminal. This one was an audio log that I downloaded to my pip leg. Now, I started playing it as I wrapped myself in a field of levitation and floated myself over to the cage. Normally, I fucking hate field reports. This sort of shit could be left to underlings. No good reason I should have to go wandering about in the equestrian shithole to get my work done. Normally, but this time, I'm really fucking happy I didn't have anyone else to trust this to. What I've found, this is too important to let some halfwit in a lab coat fuck up. Investigations into the origin of Red Eye's mystery rock took fucking forever. But it did eventually lead me to a place called Zebra Town, where I discovered a chunk of what I believed to be actual alien fucking metal. I can't wait to get this thing into my lab. I was passing over the vats. There were at least two dozen unicorns littered inside of the cage. Not a single one of them was moving. While I was at it, I got a good look at some of the prevailing theories surrounding that meteorite. Not the zebra craziness, but conclusions by ponies working under Princess fucking Luna herself. 
Opinions seem split between the meteorites ain't nothing but a rock and falling stars are vessels for fucking spirits to come into our world from outer fucking space. Because, they reckoned, folks like Discord had to come from somewhere. And they pointed out, the Zebra civilization fell into centuries of bloodshed and strife after a meteor shower. Which, of course, is fucking stupid! The Zebras didn't eat evil spirits from beyond their sky for them to plunge their country into chaos and war. I mean, have these ponies even fucking met Zebras? I've seen one of them fighting in the pit. And she was all I needed to see to know they're fucking barbaric animals. The real mystery is how the hell they built a fucking civilization in the first place. As I drew closer to the cage, I could see the slow breathing of the caged ponies. They were not dead, but they were all unconscious. Drugged, I assume. I couldn't imagine they naturally all went to sleep at the same time. I sent a pair of thanks to Celestia. If it was any pony other than me, rescue would be impossible. But I didn't need the ponies to be awake and moving in order to lead them out. Brought up the old theories to Red Eye in passing, and even he laughed. If there's a spirit here, he told me, it's the spirit of progress. Looking at my research, for once, I agree with the fucker. And actually sharing an opinion with Red Eye makes me want to gut myself with a rusty scalpel. Anyway, both sides were totally fucking far from the mark. Based on my own analysis, the meteorite did bring something, or right. But it wasn't some fucking asinine evil star demon thing. More like an infection. A virus that's got into our ecosystem and mutated. It's not quite right, but it's a hell of a lot closer than star spirits or it's just a fucking rock. No wonder they blew up the world. Ponies were stupid as shit back then. My insides felt like they were twisting up when I realised he'd been talking about Zenith. I was not sorry that Dr. Glue was dead. Not one iota. Not a single hair on my coat was worth his sympathy for that disgusting blight on pony kind. And Red Eye had employed the monster. As my hooves touched down on the top of the cage, the door that led out into the central catwalk slid open. I cringed, making myself as small and unnoticeable as possible, when Red Eye galloped in through the open door. He was alone, and once inside, his gallop dropped back to a trot, and then a walk. Despite having been running, Regardless of the war raging above his cathedral, Red Eye looked unfazed, confident, his mane and coat neatly groomed. He wore a heavy scarf, and his black 101 cape fluttered listlessly behind him. The door slid shut. As I watched, he stopped and looked around, then activated a stealth buck in his pip buck and vanished. I at once felt both alarmed and foolish. Red Eye was in the room with me, and I didn't know where or what he was doing and why I was flattening myself against the cage when I had a Stealth Buck 2, a much better one at that. I activated the MG Stealth Buck 2, removing myself from sight, and not a moment too soon. The door whisked open again, and Colonel Autumn Leaf swooped into the room. He beat his wings, ascending to get a Pegasus Eyes view of the Ascension Chamber. I know you're in here, he said gruffly. There was no other way to run. By intention, I assure you. Red Eye's voice floated out of a dozen speakers. And now that we're all here... There was a flash of light from the open doorway, and a film of magical energy washed across the walls and over the floor and ceiling. An alicorn shield. Colonel Autumn Leaf spun about to see the dark green alicorn sitting statuesque just outside the doorway. Another alicorn, a purple one, had just teleported the two of them in, and was wrapping both of them in her shield of her own. Looking up, I saw an identical two just outside the door I had entered through. Well, clearly, you have me where you want me, Autumn Leaf admitted, flying down to land on the catwalk. So, why not tell me what this is all about? What is the big plan? There was a moment of drawn-out silence, and I began to search for the lock on the cage. I finally spotted it. It was on the bottom, and picking it would cause the bottom of the cage to swing open and dump the helpless unicorns into the vat of swirling green and purple below. Of course it was. Red Eye spoke again, and this time he actually sounded surprised, although hardly displeased. Did you... did you just invite me to monologue? No, I thought. He invited you to waste enough time talking that your stealth buck drains, you become visible, and he can kill you. So you're going to become the new goddess? Autumn Leaf surmised, looking at the vats. Is that it? Replace the one you killed? 
That's not wrong, Red Eye admitted. And what does this have to do with the sustained Pegasus project? Autumn Leaf prompted, taking to the air to peer beneath the catwalk, searching for the hiding Earth Pony. Oh, everything! Red Eye proclaimed, clearly warming up to the conversation. You see, I finally found the way inside. Oh, really? The Jade Armored Pegasus perked up. Do tell, because from my understanding, it is impossible, and that makes you a liar. Impossible? Hardly. Red Eye's voice proclaimed from the dozen speakers. There are several things that can get through an Alicorn shield, even one that powerful. Telepathy, telekinesis, certain types of dragon magic, and most importantly, anyone that the shield is enchanted with a bypass for can walk or teleport through. Or, as you know, anyone sufficiently related. Right, Autumn Leaf agreed. Too bad Rainbow Dash had no descendants. Ah, but Rainbow Dash wasn't the only one the SPP Hub's shield was designed to let through. Red Eye countered, and now he had Colonel Autumn Leaf's full attention. It was also designed to let the princesses through. Wait, what? I have a hard time believing you will be any condition to go anywhere, Autumn Leaf pointed out, judging by the late goddess. I guess that behind his visor, he was rolling his eyes. True, but I will be able to maintain telepathic control over one of my children, who will take control of the central hub as a vessel of my will. Autumn Leaf began searching for Red Eye again. If you're thinking that one of those sorry excuses for Alicorns can get through that shield, you are pathetically mistaken. Several have already tried. The alien fire blaster swiveled as he scanned the room. Oh, I know. Red Eye almost purred. We sent them. I will admit that Nightseer's failure did send me back to the proverbial drawing board. Nightseer. It took me a moment to conjure a face. The crazy alicorn in the royal castle. The one who had fallen under the influence of the Black Book and was wearing Luna's skull as a necklace. That was the alicorn who the goddesses and Red Eye had tasked with getting through the SPP shield. And she failed. That actually explained a lot in a very twisted way. It was from her failure that I discovered just why the goddess's alicorns couldn't make it through, and what was needed. It was just like you said. They are sorry excuses for alicorns. They are flawed, missing something vital to what an alicorn should be, and thus too far removed from what an alicorn should be, and thus Celestia. Almost as if he wanted to assuage the feelings of the alicorns maintaining the shield, Red Eye kindly added, No fault of their own. It is the failing in their templates. What are you blathering about? Autumn Leaf asked. He had made a full circle around the room, checking behind each of the vats, and was now landing back on the central catwalk. If you understood the creature your High Council had tried to make friendly with, you'd understand. Red Eye chided. The essence of the goddess was formed out of the souls of four dominant ponies, and these ponies, in turn, provided the metaphysical template for the alicorns to follow. Red Eye wasn't saying anything I didn't already know, and we weren't apparently going anywhere until his stealth buck ran out, or something else changed the status quo. So I focused my attention on the unicorns. They seemed healthy, unharmed, and even surprisingly well fed, far more than the slaves in Philadelphia. It occurred to me that some of these unicorns might have volunteered. If so, they were either fanatical disciples or severely misled. I also noticed that each one was wearing a mechanical collar with a tiny red light. The collars were locked shut. Unfortunately, Red Eye continued, the templates lacked a certain critical diversity. Yeah, they were all females. The goddess had a plan for that. It involved a really, really bad book. They were all unicorns. Oh, I never thought of that. But I supposed it was true as well. Twilight Sparkle, Trixie, Gestalt and Mosaic, all unicorns. Whoa, pull back the reins. To create alicorns that can bypass that shield, the templates require a certain... unity. Each race of pony kind adds to the whole. The voice of the younger Red Eye whispered in my head. No one greater or more important than the others. It is a vital Gestalt, requiring all three. Oh no... A new deity needs to be created with templates from all three races. Red Eye revealed. 
which meant I needed to find a Pegasus and a Unicorn who was strong enough in mind and soul to become dominant aspects with me in the new godhood. We are all going to get to know each other very well. You in me. Oh, fuck no. Colonel Autumn looked appalled, and then he broke into uncontrolled snickers. What? Colonel Autumn Leaf laughed. You're expecting me to take a swim with you? He cantered to the edge of the platform, asking, Or were you planning to drop me in like what happened to Trixie? He flapped his wings, hovering above the catwalk, showing off. Yes, he added, answering the unspoken question. I did my research. As did I, Red Eye told him. Poor little Autumn Leaf, a middle child, trapped between the perfect son, the loser, and the mistake. So you took the only path left, the overachiever. You have the drive, the ambition, not to mention the charisma and force of will, to become the leader of an impressive military force, one of the highest ranking officers in your entire country. And yet, it is all born out of a desire for approval. Autumn Leaf hovered silently, then slowly spoke. You know nothing. Not from your father, not any more. You're now the obedient servant of much more powerful ponies than him. But for all your power, you're still just a dog responding to its master's call, hoping to be petted. Red Eye purred cruelly. That's what makes you perfect. You're powerful enough soul to become a template, but you'll never be able to challenge me for true dominance. The room was utterly silent and still, save for the flapping of Autumn Leaf's wings. Sorry, Red Eye, he said finally, his voice feigning jovial dismissal. But you lose. I'm not drinking your cup of delusion. He looked pointedly into the cup on the pedestal. Find some pony else. The cup erupted in a crackling blast as Red Eye set off the Matrix disruption grenade he had hidden inside it. Colonel Autumn Leaf's armor went dead, and he dropped onto the platform with a resounding clang, utterly paralyzed. Red Eye disengaged his stealth buck, appearing on the catwalk less than two yards away. He walked up and nudged the incapacitated Enclave leader with a hoof. I'll admit you did surprise me, Red Eye offered generously. I needed the Enclave to send some Pegasi within my reach, but your insane level of overreaction caught me entirely off guard. Red Eye lowered his head to Autumn Leaf's helmet. I've spent more time scrambling to adjust to your Enclave's massive overkill than I care to admit. What in the name of whatever you hold holy did you expect? Autumn Leaf growled, trapped within his armor like steel hooves had been when I first talked to him. What you are planning is nothing short of annihilating an entire country's crops. Your megalomania threatens the Pegasi with massive famine and starvation. You're attempting to become the greatest mass murderer in Equestria's history, just so you can claim credit for a sunny day. Oh, goddesses. Is that what I was doing too? My own plan was not so far different. What was the cost compared to the cruelty of that? The paltry help I had given the ponies of the wasteland paled to insignificance. To resurrect Equestria... Red Eye answered bluntly. Sacrifices must be made. The callousness of his words struck me. Yes, I was also planning to take control of the single Pegasus project. The Enclave needed to be stopped, and Velvet Remedy was right. You can't stop something until you take away its reason for being that way. Furthermore, the ponies of the Wasteland deserved to see Celestia's sun again, to know that warmth and hope that only a sunny day could bring. But I wasn't the sort of cold uncompassionate creature I saw in both of the ponies below me. I knew something that neither Red Eye nor Autumn Leaf knew. A game-changing factor that made it possible for my plan to succeed without doing unspeakable harm. I knew about the Gardens of Equestria. Although, in the end, the Enclave's actions, that is to say, your actions, have served my intentions nicely. Red Eye gloated gently. You've made yourself so much the villains that our new godhood will be celebrated as a saviour when I end you. Colonel Autumn Leaf began to swear. Maybe I will be the one ending you. Interesting fact, Red Eye said over Autumn Leaf's threatening string of curses. Four ponies became the templates within the goddess, but they didn't form the goddess equally. The goddess was dominated by one mind, one will, and it wasn't the most powerful of the four. No, that would have been Twilight Sparkle. Instead, it was Trixie. 
And not just Trixie, but Trixie the show pony, the most charismatic of the four. I'll be sharing godhood with a martyr who wants to save every pony and a gutless tool. He smirked. I'm feeling pretty confident in my chances. Red Eye turned his gaze up towards the cage. You can come out now. What? My little pony stammered. I. but. oh, forget it. Her head slumped in defeat. I disengaged the stealth buck and stared down at the wasteland's other stable dweller. Red Eye smiled at me. Not a chance in hell! I told him bluntly. Up to you, he said, surprising me. Wait, you're giving me a choice? Red Eye walked up to the catwalk railing, placed his hooves on it, and peered into the swirling colours of the vat beneath. Of course I am. Why? I had to know. Because I'm going to have a hard enough time struggling against him. He tilted his head towards the collapsed body of Autumn Leaf. I don't want to be fighting both of the other templates, and I figure there's a far better chance that you'll spend godhood actually trying to help the Wasteland through your benevolent rule, rather than trying to undermine me out of petty revenge, if you actually choose to be there. And finally, Red Eye paused, seeming to consider what he wanted to say. Because unlike him, he said, whipping his tail towards Autumn Leaf, it doesn't have to be you. I blinked. My name had been his password. And now he was really saying he didn't need me? That I really wasn't special after all? I felt as wounded as I felt relieved. There are 25 unicorns in that cage, he pointed out. 25 hoof-picked chances for a good unicorn template. One of them is bound to be sufficient. But you... He snorted musedly. You're a sure thing. Imagine my surprise when fate dropped you right in front of me at the seventh hour. A unicorn who not only had all the qualities that guaranteed a strong template, but who would volunteer to become part of the godhood, and whose rulership would actually make our new Equestria a better, richer place. I've always known that I was taking a gamble, no matter how much I researched, planned, and created contingencies. Inevitably, all my efforts would come down to the roll of a dice. You just allowed me to hedge my bets more than I would have thought possible. My mind caught on one word in all of that. Volunteer. Why would I ever... Because you don't want to risk what will happen if you don't. He said simply. You already know what he's like. You're not going to run the risk the godhood will manifest with him in charge. Or some third pony you don't know who might be just as bad. You said he couldn't possibly challenge you. I reminded him plaintively. Oh, very true, Red Eye told me. But I'm not the one who'll be ruling Equestria. I told you before, I'm too much of a monster for the world we're creating. I have no place in it. That'll be your job, remember? He chuckled. Besides, I'm going to have my plate full controlling the sun, moon, and weather. My jaw dropped. Oh, dear, Red Eye laughed. How else did you think I was planning for you to take over my work? My forces and my followers aren't going to be loyal to a new leader just because I tell them to, but they will be loyal to the new me, and any part of me. I reeled. Really, little bit. Did you ever take the time to seriously think this through, or did you just assume I was lying? I felt numb, removed, like the world was a distant, faraway place. I was in a cocoon of elseness, staring out at reality through hazy gauze. The paralysis broke when Red Eye hefted one hind leg over the railing. Stop! I ordered as I floated at Little Macintosh, taking aim. You're kidding. Red Eye looked up at me, shock dissolving into contempt. He stared down the barrel pointed between his eyes. You're kidding, right? No! I told him sternly. I'm taking option three! The one where I don't have to worry about what the ponies of the Godhood are like because there isn't a new Godhood at all! Take the shot! Autumn Leaf growled. We both ignored him. Really, little Pip? Red Eye asked. Would you doom the ponies of Equestria to the wasteland, to another 200 years of futile struggle, poverty and hardship, all ending in death, usually at the whim of the wasteland's raiders and monsters? They need us, little Pip. Where will they be without our leadership? What will become of them without our guidance? They don't need us. They don't need a god to save them. They can save themselves. I admire your faith, little Pip. So childlike. 
but now it is time to grow up. Was it? Was I just being naive? No! I said slowly, not sure where my thoughts and words were going. Maybe I think it's time for them to grow up. I thought of the Twilight Society sitting on a treasure of magic and not using it to help any pony. Of the Steel Rangers preying on others to survive in their selfish drive to hoard the technologies of the past. Of New Appaloosa, willing to trade with slavers and not lifting a hoof about the horrors of old Appaloosa not so far from their door. It's time for the ponies of the wasteland to stop being so selfish and short-sighted. To start caring about their fellow ponies. To raise their hooves and aid in communal support. To work whether to build something bigger and better, not because they're being forced to, but because they want to. For themselves and for their children. I remembered the words of Life Bloom. This is us helping. It's time for the ponies to tell the wasteland to buck off. I thought of the Applejack's rangers and Steel Hooves' words in Stable too. Today, you must choose with whom your oath lies. Surrender this ignominious goal and join by my side, reaffirming your oath to the protection of the citizens of Equestria. I remember Damage's broadcast. And I've got more reports coming in. Heroes all the way from Shadow Hoop to Hoofington have been holding the line against the nightmares from above. And you know what? I continued. I couldn't have stopped. It was like an avalanche had started inside of me. I think they want to. They're ready to. You've shown them the rebuilding is possible. I've... I've what? I knew what. I'd been an example. I couldn't listen to Amarge without her drumming it into my head. But saying it, accepting it, was another thing entirely. I knew I was nothing special, but my reputation had become something powerful. I've been their Lightbringer, I said finally, coating the concept in Amarge's words and hoping it didn't sound concited. We've done what we can. Ah, uh, well, I wasn't done quite yet. I still had one big play to make. But I was done here, with him. And now it's time for Daddy Red Eye and Mummy Little Pip to get the fuck out of their way. Goddesses, that's where my thoughts were going. Ick. Most dysfunctional family ever. I mentally divorced myself from Red Eye. Red Eye chuckled. A good-humoured sound. Having a laugh at my bizarre little speech. Dear little Pip... You can't really believe that. Not after all you've seen. If ponies were capable of that, then they would have done so already. They wouldn't have needed us in the first place. He stared downwards into the glowing, swirling liquid. If left to their own devices, without us, they would collapse back into the same routines that have kept them under the hoof of the equestrian wasteland for 200 years. Ponies. And I snorted. Ponies never change. We've made mistakes, I countered. Ponies do that. We all make mistakes. We have flaws and weaknesses, but we're stronger when we're together. I felt the comforting weight of the ministry mares in my saddlebag. And together, we can be better than this. We have to be better than this, my little pony added. We're ponies. Stirring, Red Eye quipped, straddling the railing. Inspirational, even. Now, if you'll excuse me... I have an ascension to bathe in. I cocked little Macintosh warningly. Back away from the edge or I will put you down. No, no you won't. Red Eye stated flatly. Two reasons. First, he reached a hoof up to his scarf and pulled it away, revealing a collar identical to the ones on the unicorns. Because I'm wearing this. Little Macintosh lowered ever so slightly as I stared at him in confusion. Bomb collars. Red Eye explained. Zebras used to put them around the necks of prisoners of war and set them free. They'd wait for the prisoner to make it back to the other ponies. Then, boom! I felt queasy. My eyes lowered to the unicorns in the cage, each with a death trap around his or her neck. These particular bomb collars are linked. If one is disarmed or the pony wearing it dies, then, boom! All of them go off. Red Eye leveled the gaze at me. You kill me... You kill them. The new signal my EFS had notified me about, I realised, had been the bomb collar's shared frequency. Every time I thought I knew Red Eye. And if something hadn't gone according to plan, if Autumn Leaf had gotten off a lucky shot and killed him before this point, just by wearing that thing, he was toying with the lives of the unicorns beneath me in a whole new disgusting level. You'd have to disarm them all simultaneously. 
He told me, You... You might just be good enough with telekinesis to perform separate, delicate operations on two dozen devices at the same time. But how skilled are you with explosives? He had me. Damn it, he had me! Damn it, I could barely disarm a grenade bouquet. And second, because if you are going with that option, you would have shot me already. I really, really hated Red Eye. This was really happening. I I was really actually going to do this? The little pony in my head was telling me I couldn't just let Red Eye win, but that sounded more like childish rivalry and stubborn pride, and I wasn't going to sacrifice these unicorns, much less the future of the wasteland for something so selfish. Really, in a way, it wasn't that different from what I had intended, was it? No, it really was. I was trying to bring hope to the wasteland, to banish a very real darkness, and I was willing to lose everything I had, even a marge, to give that to the ponies of Equestria. I wasn't trying to gain anything. I wasn't putting myself on a pedestal or on a throne, but that's what Red Eye wanted. And besides, I do have your friends. He reminded me. After all, reputation is magic. What about my friends? I asked harshly. Where's Zenith? What have you done to Velvet Remedy? What? Don't worry, Red Eye assured me. They're fine, all of them. I sent one of my best purples to invite them here. She gave them an offer they would be hard-pressed to refuse, and they'll continue to be fine as long as you don't do something stupid. Right, they're all helpless at the mercy of my choices. My little pony snorted. Red Eye had a terrible habit of underestimating my friends. I thought of my friends. How would they feel about this? What counsel would they give? The answer hit me like a bucket of ice water. Steel Hooves would not approve. Steel Hooves joined me because I represented a chance to do something better, to be a better pony. He died pursuing that belief, and he would be utterly disgusted that I was even contemplating Red Eye's offer. I owed him better than that. Once again, I remembered sitting with him, staring out over the bay at Friendship City. The city of ponies, I noted, that Colonel Autumn Leaf had burned off the map. But then, hadn't I annihilated a town myself? How could I allow the pony who raised Arbu to become ruler of Equestria? Look at the mistakes I'd made, the damage I'd done. Monterey Jack, party time Mintels. I couldn't take the role once held by the princesses. Red Eye thought I'd be unable to trust any pony else with that power. I knew I couldn't trust myself with it. Red Eye was appealing to my virtues, both corrupted and true. He knew me better than I knew myself. He always had. But what Red Eye did not understand, had never understood, was friendship. Alone, we were weak, at the mercy of our failings. But together, as friends, we were strong. We buttressed each other. We shared our strengths, protecting each other from our vulnerabilities. Even when apart, I thought of my friends, and I thought of their virtues. Loyalty and kindness, perseverance and humility. Red Eye's offer flew in the face of all of them. Red Eye jumped, and I concentrated. A moment later, the red-coated stallion floated up, wrapped in my magic, until he was level with my position on top of the cage. His legs flailed at the air helplessly, struggling to get down. Then Red Eye let out a heavy sigh, his head drooping. I forgot you might do that, he admitted. He sighed again, giving a plaintive look. Why? Because the ponies of the wasteland deserve a better ruler than me, I told him. And a better god than you. My EFS compass suddenly came alive with a swarm of red lights. There's something else you're forgetting. A voice called up from below us. Autumn Leaf had been silent long enough that I'd forgotten he was conscious. Scissors beats paper. The alicorn shield collapsed as Enclave Helmeted Hellhounds tore up at the alicorns at the entrances. Their claws slicing easily through the purple alicorns' protective shields. More gouged their way in through the walls and ceiling and even the floor. One of the vats began to drain as at least one hellhound had the misfortune of digging up into the room directly beneath it. Hellhounds beat alicorns. No! Red Eye shouted, seeing decades of carefully laid plans torn apart. A heavy, muffled thud vibrated through the ascension chamber, followed by another 
as something began to hammer the cathedral from above. A whole new level of bombardment. The overcast, I realised, had started bombarding the fortress with its heaviest weapons. What if the hellhounds charged onto the catwalk, pulling out a magical energy rifle, and fired? The purple pulse struck Red Eye, dissolving a plate-sized chunk of his scarred Cutie Mark III flank. His pony eye opened wide in shock, and Red Eye began to die. Fuck! I couldn't save him. He'd be dead in seconds, and he was going to take all of us with him. Inspiration hit. Born of panic, I pulled the MG Stealth Buck 2 out of my pip leg and swapped in the Cantalot broadcaster, setting it to broadcast on every frequency I could before turning it on. My head exploded as death tainted static poured into the room. My magic imploded, dropping the dying red eye into the vat beneath us as a vice clamped down on my horn. My eyes began to bleed. The unicorns beneath me moaned in agony. Inside his suit, Colonel Autumn screamed, and several of the hellhounds howled, collapsing and writhing. More than a few managed to tear off their helmets. More beams of light slashed through the room. One of them struck the cage, dissolving one of the tranquilized unicorns, the glowing ash spilling down into the IM pool below. The bomb collars didn't go off. Like on the lenticular, the cantaloupe static completely flooded the collar's channel, preventing them from sending the trigger signal. I turned off the broadcaster, fishing out a healing potion and downing it swiftly. I then focused on the cage's lock as I wrapped the unicorns in a telekinetic sheath. We were too exposed here, and I needed to get us out. More heavy thuds shook the chamber. The cathedral was being pulverized. Take me with you, Colonel Autumn Leaf commanded. Save me! Go with your hellhounds! I shouted back. They haven't been ordered to do that, he admitted, pleading. My first officer is about to turn this place into a crater. And the hellhounds were acceptable losses. There was no provision in their orders for self-preservation. The lock clicked. The bottom of the cage swung open. The 24 remaining ponies floating in place above the vat of swirling IMP below. Look, I'm good with explosives, the colonel bargained. I can walk you through disarming those collars, but only if you take me with you. I glowered, staring at the pony who had been behind the destruction of the Cantalot ruins. The murderer of Star Sparkle. The pony who had ordered his own brother, my best friend, to be hunted and killed. Who had sent the Wonderbolts after us, ordered the attacks on Friendship City, New Appaloosa, and more. On one condition! I told Calamity's brother. Anything! He agreed readily. Tell me how to rig that Star Blaster's battery to explode! I ordered. Dr. Glue had indicated there were tunnels beneath the cathedral. The hellhounds were already spilling taint into them. How much worse would the Everfree Forest become once the room had torn apart and all of this, a million tons of pure IMP, released into the environment? I couldn't even imagine what that would do to Equestria. It would be more devastating than a mega spell. It wasn't enough to let this room be destroyed. It needed to be vaporized. My head was pounding, my brain trying to claw its way out of my skull. There was a warm, wet stickiness dribbling out of my ears and nostrils, and my abused horn protested. The effort it took to pick the lock on the last collar seemed more than it took to once float a boxcar. The collar snapped open, and I shut off the broadcaster one last time, slumping against the wall. We were in what was left of Dr. Glow's laboratory. My gaze lingered over all the unicorns. I had only turned on the broadcaster for a few seconds for each collar, but the cumulative toll was devastating. I was out of healing potions, and four of the ponies hadn't survived. The rational part of my brain, or as much of it that wasn't trying to leak out of my ears, told me that I'd saved 20 lives out of 25, and that four out of five wasn't that bad. The little pony in my head was weeping, mourning every one of the five I had failed. The powerful thudding overhead caused part of the ceiling above to give, raining down dirt and several blocks of stone reminding me that I hadn't saved any pony yet until we were all out of here. All I'd done was delay their deaths. I wiped my pit leg across my eyes and it came back smeared with red. My gaze shifted to the limp form of Autumn Leaf, trapped in his unique jade enclave armour. I'd refused to reboot it until he had filled his part of the deal. I didn't want to be incinerated by that alien weapon as repayment for my helping hoof. Crawling over to him, turning my attention to the alien fire blaster, Okay, one more bomb to deal with, and then I'll set you free. 
Removing the alien fire blaster and rigging its power core was far more complex than I had imagined. It spoke volumes to me, realizing how skilled Amarge was to have done what she did. I felt a happy pang in my heart, pride in my mare mixing with the hurtful reality that I would almost certainly never see her face again. And there just wasn't enough time. There was never enough time. The homemade explosive hummed to life, the charges from the bomb collars ringing the bright orange glow of the Star Blaster's power core. I set the timer and floated it down the stairwell, guiding it right into the ascension chamber. I knew the room well enough that I didn't have to see it to place the bomb right into Red Eye's cup. I gave us ten minutes. The hammering above shook the room, but I didn't think the overcast would be able to blast this deep quite that quickly. Okay then, Colonel Autumnleaf said. Reboot me and let's get the hell out of here. I turned to Calamity's brother, the Butcher of the Wastelands, setting him free. It wasn't a question of whether he'd do more damage, but how much. How many more ponies was I going to let him murder by letting him go? A realisation swept over me. A determined frown crept across my muzzle. I crouched down to him, telekinetically lifting his visor so I could look into his eyes. Autumn Leaf had fiery hazel eyes. Calamity's eyes. The realisation struck me painfully. They were tinted crimson. Streams of blood running from the corners, matting his coat and pooling in his helmet. There's something you should know about me. I told him sadly. I'm not the bearer of honesty, but I know her, and I love her. I floated at Little Macintosh. Autumn Leaf's eyes went wide. <laughs> Standing back up, I slid Applejack's gun into its holster and began floating the twenty still-living ponies in the room. For the longest time, I thought of myself as Red Eye's reflection, granting one of Pinkie Pie's particularly warped funhouse mirrors. But I was comparing myself to the wrong pony, I wasn't Red Eye. I was Apple Snack. All of my friends were already waiting at the tortoise when I galloped up. Twenty still unconscious uniforms floating in tow. Well, all right! Calamity whooped. Let's get this show on the wing! The cathedral was nothing but rubble. Only a few of the barrack houses still halfway intact. The overcast was hammering the ground with blasts of multi hued energy pulverizing its way through the sublevels. The Thunderhead itself was heavily damaged, pouring smoke from multiple breaches. The rumble of its thunderclouds no longer steady or harmonious. The dragon and alicorns were nowhere to be seen. Any of Red Eye's troops who had survived had fled into the Evergreen Forest, which I imagined was just waiting to eat them. Calamity had gathered everyone in the tortoise, friends and overcast escapees alike, and relocated to the shelter created by one of the downed raptors. From the shredding of its hull, I suspected the dragon had taken it down. Fortunately, I had the tortoise's tag on my pit leg. So, after a brief spark of panic, I had no trouble finding it. Autumn Leaf? Calamity asked as I arrived, panting and dripping with sweat. He didn't make it, I said, choosing not to elaborate. Neither did Red Eye. A pained expression settled on Calamity's face. It's for the best, really, he said turning towards the sky tank's cockpit. My headache was pounding hard enough to rival the overcast's bombardment, and it spiked to teeth-gnashing intensity with each epic boom. I wanted my friends, a bed, and a pony-sized healing potion. I opened the back, but was immediately yanked inside into a hug. Little Pip, where have you been? I've been so worried. It really flooded me, and I hugged her back. Learning to play rock, paper, scissors? I told her. I thought of the starboard explosive I'd left behind, due to go off any moment now, if it hadn't already. I bet on rock! My relief was replaced with mane raising alarms I spotted, over her shoulder and through wisps of her mane, with the sleeping form of the albino hellhound. Despite how crowded the tortoise was, the other ponies were cringing back, avoiding touching the creature. I hoped he was under velvet's spell and thoroughly sedated to boot. My eyes drifted down over the body to lock on the shiny, cybernetic leg where hours ago nothing had been. You let yourself be taken prisoner in order to help the hellhound, didn't you? I said dully. We had everything under control. Five Bloom piped up from where he was tending to Reggie, the scarlet glow from his horn matching the glow around Reggie's crippled arm. Then it's back at the hut. There isn't anything more I can do for her, and we didn't dare move her. Fortunately, the Alicorn didn't seem to care. They left her alone. 
highlights back there watching over her. Lifebloom added. Okay, I thought, remembering my time in Philadelphia. Not alone then. That I could accept. Yes, and Calamity was so gallant. Velvet cooed. You should have seen him. His enclave hellhounds guarding us never stood a chance. My head hurts a lot. I moved one of the rucksacks, fishing for a healing potion, as Calamity strapped himself into the harness. What tarnation's that one doing? He asked suddenly, craning to look upwards out of his armored window. I turned around and stuck my head out of the open door of the sky tank, looking upwards at the massive thunderhead above the pulverized remains of the cathedral. One badly damaged raptor had remelded into the overcast of storm clouds, and a second was moving up, trailing plumes of black smoke behind it as it struggled to keep altitude long enough to dock. A shadow of a third raptor was visible through the smoke, approaching from the far side. Approaching awfully fast. I looked around, counting four downed raptors. Three, apparently from the Cyber Dragon, and one from the artillery cannons the cathedral used to have. The left two, the lenticular and the raptor that had gone off chasing it. I floated in my ear bloom, bracing myself, and turned on the Enclave's interwarship channel, ready to turn it off at the first hiss of static. Instead, I heard the voice of a mare. Raptor lenticular, this is the Thunderhead Overcast. If you do not respond, we will shoot you out of the sky. There was no response. Several of the Overcast's guns swiveled towards the oncoming warship. Raptor lenticular, cut your engines. This is your last warning. The Raptor did not cut its engines. If anything, it looked like it was speeding up. Wah, Nelly! Calamity shouted out. That bird's gonna ram her! The Overcast opened fire, but it was already too late. The blasts of super-intensified magical energy flashed holes in the lenticular, causing the ship to bleed. But it stayed its course, not slowing. I stared, my eyes growing wider and wider as I realised what I was seeing. The raptor was bleeding. Pinkish vapour was pouring out of its wounds. The raptor lenticular was full of pink cloud. The Overcast had stopped its bombardment and was trying to move, but the massive ship had the speed and agility of a turtle. A new voice... A gravelly stallion's voice boomed over the military channel with an almost supernatural power. For Cantalot! The raptor lenticular struck the overcast with a rapturous explosion. Whoever was aboard had front-loaded the ship with every bomb on board. The explosion blew out both of the overclass's thunderclouds on the struck side and tore a massive hole in the side of the mobile siege platform. The raptor wedging into the bigger ship like a poisonous dart. I spotted the silhouette of a pony-like figure flee from the rear of the lenticular. Flying away on bat-like wings, even as Pegasi started to pour out of the mortally wounded Thunderhead, abandoning ship. Beneath the tortoise, the ground shifted, collapsing downward. The bomb I'd created gone off, silently vaporizing the earth beneath us. And now the ruins of the cathedral were collapsing into a massive sinkhole. Calamity needed no other encouragement. He beat his wings and pulled the tortoise into the air, fleeing the scene with a tank full of escapees and twenty floating unicorns in tow. I turned and sat, looking out the back door and drinking a health potion. We almost made it back to Zakora's hut. I heard the crack of the shot and Calamity's yelp as the bullet from Gutshot's anti-machine rifle pierced the cockpit and struck into the wing muscles on Calamity's right side crippling him. The tortoise dropped, smashing into treetops. My levitation spell imploded as I was thrown out of the back door, which flew open, scattering ponies into the forest below. My body slammed into a thick branch hard enough to snap it, breaking ribs, bruising my abdomen and knocking the wind out of me. I tumbled through the tree, feeling like I was being viciously pummeled by raiders. My right hind leg hit a branch badly and I heard a snap, followed by a searing pain. I slammed into the ground on my back, my EFS flashing warnings, and blacked out. When I came to, Velvet Remedy was standing over me, her horn glowing as she focused on my broken hind leg. Reggie was standing at my side, her bad arm bandaged in a sling, blood pouring down a series of gashes along her head and flanks. She was staring forward, glaring daggers. My eyes caught one suit of carapace armour, and another, and another... We were surrounded by the Wonderbolts, and they were having a heated argument. There were voices all around me. Two of them were Calamities. What the hell is this? Calamity's voice asked. 
You fell into the blue plants, didn't you, Gutshafts? Calamity snapped back wryly. I knew it burned your feathers to be second best, but I never imagined you'd want to be me. His voice was slowly rising. Have you met me? Have you seen Marlaf? I turned, following the voices, to see a bleeding and bedraggled Calamity staring down a mirror image of himself in Wonderbolt armor. The anti-machine rifle of his battle saddle pointed between my best friend's eyes. Gutshot, stand down! Skydive ordered, stepping up beside Calamity. Like hell I will! The Calamity doppelganger shouted. We still have a mission! Yes, Strafewise countered, approaching to flank the real Calamity on the other side. But not this one. We run the clock. Back away! Gutshot shouted, trembling. They weren't blocking his shot, but he seemed unwilling to take it while they stood against him. We can't fail this one! I can't fail this one! We'll be failing a lot more than orders if you pull that trigger. Jet spoke up, her voice low and rich like dark chocolate. Things were not the way we thought they were. What the hell has gotten into you? He's the enemy! Deadshot's a traitor! Deadshot? Calamity said, swaying from blood loss. Damn it! Are you so fixated on that you can't see what's round in front of your face? A scream erupted right beside me. Every pony spun round to see Regina Grimfeathers slump over, a gaping hole in her breast, smoke rising from it. The light of life was quickly fading from her eyes, exactly like her twin. No! I whimpered, my ears pasting back. Who fired that shot? Skydive barked, but no shot had been fired. I saw a little tendril of blue wrapping around Reggie's left hind leg, and the others coming for Velvet and I. It should be Cage here, not me. Regina had said that. What else had she said that I hadn't heard? No! I shouted, leaping into the air and grabbing all three of us in telekinetic magic. Velvet Remedy reacted just as swiftly, throwing her shield spell over the ground and trapping the squirming vines beneath it. This was not going to happen again. I was not going to lose Regina like I failed her brother. We had Velvet Remedy with us this time. We had Life Bloom. This was not going to happen. Life Bloom! I shouted, but he was already ahead of me, casting a stabling spell on the griffin and holding her slide into death. (coughs) I spun around at the gunshot. Calamity had little Macintosh in his mouth, smoke coming from the barrel. His doppelganger, Gutshot, was trying to shoot back. Unwounded, but nothing was happening. Calamity's shot had disabled the Wonderbolt's battle saddle. With a roar, Gutshot threw himself at Calamity. (laughs) Gutshot fell to the ground, clutching his crippled foreleg. The other Wonderbolts moved in to surround him. Calamity spat out little Macintosh and looked at them apologetically. I reckon there was no avoiding that, he said glumly. Every forest was my idea and I had never had a plan that didn't amount to shoot myself in the hoop. We had a long trek back to Zakora's hut. Velvet Remedy's shield shimmered beneath us as we walked. Between the crash and the Everfree Forest, we'd lost ten more of the ponies I'd rescued, most of them unicorns. Of those who survived, four had wrapped themselves in cloaks of denial and galloped off. Red Eye couldn't be dead after all. He was going to be a god. He was going to bring unity. The others were trudging along with us, shell-shocked and not speaking a word. None of us felt much like talking either. The only sounds were the distant crackling of flames, the plodding of pony hooves on magical shield, and the mechanical hiss that the albino hellhound's leg made with every step. He was walking with us, at least for now. The Wonderbolts had helped us find the ponies our crash had scattered across the forest. They weren't ready to act against the Enclave, but they were going to sit the rest of the conflict out, not helping them either. Skydive promised to look us up after the dust settled. They had also helped find the rucksacks full of medical supplies. About half of them had survived the crash, and most of those had been used repairing the wounds inflicted in the crash. Tracker had taken off with the Wonderbolts when they left. Red Eye was defeated and gone. Autumn Leaf was defeated and gone. And yet... I didn't feel the least bit victorious. I felt like I'd managed to mitigate failure. I had to do better than this. Ahead of us lay Navarro and the single Pegasus project. At the same time, the Enclave was mounting a massive assault on Philadelphia. Calamity assured me that the Colonel's death wasn't going to prevent that. They had their orders, 
and another pony was already groomed to step into Autumn Leaf's possession. The Enclave wasn't like a cantaloupe ghoul. It didn't die when you cut off its head. After an hour, we stopped to take a break, catch our breath. Life Bloom had been floating Reggie along above him, and now he and Velvet Remedy turned their healing attentions once again to the horribly wounded adolescent Griffin. She was stable, thanks entirely to Life Bloom. His spell was putting her in some sort of suspended animation, the same magic used by Cottage Cheese's medical pod, and the control pod in the SPP central hub. Non-idle curiosity pushed me to stare, wondering what it would be like. I had to force myself to look away. Turning my attention to my pip leg, I realised I still had an audio recording I hadn't listened to, the old audio log we had found in the stable tech chest in Zakora's hut. I slipped in my ear bloom, turning it on. Um, hello? A sweet, familiar voice sounded in my ear. This feels weird, and I know you can't actually hear me, Zakora, but Appleton says you're always a good person to talk to, and I really needed to talk. I can't bring this stuff to Appleboom and Scootaloo, and I really don't talk with my sister anymore, so I hope you don't mind. This is Sweetie Belle, by the way. Not that you can hear me, but if you can and didn't know. I've been thinking about things, and I know this is going to sound silly, but one of the things I've been thinking about a lot is, well, rocks. Footnote, maximum level. And with that comes the end of Red Eye. There's a guy. I'm not sorry to see him go. There was a character in the story. He was really good. And if anything, I liked him. Though I must say, I'm kind of sorry Pip wasn't the one to pull the trigger. Though I'm not sure whether that would have been all right for her. Glad to see Autumn Leaf go, though. Fucking psycho. Deserve what he got for killing Pastel and Winslip. Bastards. And it's good to see the Wonderbolts are turned around. No matter. Here's some music. The Dashite song as a final fuck you to the Enclave. Enjoy, people.